Hey everyone, it's Ryan from Rocky Mountain Cigar Show. Thank you for joining me on yet another live Thursday night show. I, I love doing this absolutely every single week. Never gets old, boring for me, and I hope it doesn't for you as well. We've got an absolutely fantastic show planned up for tonight with two fantastic guests. One's a familiar face, especially if you're in the McAuliffe Ambassadors group, then you know her very well. And the other one? Well, we'll let her introduce herself. She can do it better than me, I'm sure. So, but before we get into the show here, holy cow, I was at TGS last week. And for everybody that was so kind to come up and say hi, to tell me kind words that you watch the show and, and you follow me, thank you so much. It was a forever a humbling experience to meet everybody. And some of you I got to meet that have been watching me for quite some time. And, and that was very, very... I was very lucky to be able to have that experience. And thank you to everybody that was so kind to come up and say hi. On top of that, holy crap, TGS was a ton of fun. Uh, my wife and I had such an amazing time. And we are already planning to go back for next year for Year of the Dragon. So definitely, uh, if you're planning or would like to plan uh, a big cigar event filled with just Family is what it is. It's not even friends. It's family. Everybody's family there. Um, definitely keep an eye out. Join Smoke In Social on Facebook and keep an eye out and an ear to the ground for upcoming news and information, at most likely about November and October, November. Uh, for booking your room as well as uh, tickets for the event. And if you're looking to go VIP, you better buy quick because I think all the VIPs went within an hour. So big shout out to all the show sponsors that make this happen. We have BAMP Cigars, ROCF Cigars, Christoph Cigars, uh, K by Karen Burger. We have New Air Humidors. We've got Sagrado. We've got McAuliffe Cigars, whose McAuliffe is the March takeover uh, and who actually Lauren works for. Uh, we have Big Sky Cigars as well as Cornell and Deal Pipe Tobacco. Thank you to everybody that makes this show remotely possible. I couldn't do it without any of these great sponsors, and I couldn't do it without the fantastic uh, group of audience and fans that uh, that supports this show every single week. So uh, enough babbling by me. Nobody really comes to listen to me. They come for the guests. So let's go ahead and uh, bring in the guest here. Let me do a little bit of rearranging. All right. How y'all doing tonight, ladies? Excellent. Fantastic. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. I am so sorry. Real quick. Uh, because I, this is the second week that I'm doing this and I better say it right. Uh, coming to you from the smoke in studios, the Rocky mountain cigar show. That's the new name of the studios. And I dropped the ball. I'm sorry, ladies. I had to throw it in there, uh, because that was actually a contest to kind of name all that. How does that sound by the way? Sounds badass. You, right from the smoke in studios, the Rocky mountain cigar show. I think that's awesome. But anyways, enough about whatever that is uh please introduce yourself our guestess of honor lauren oh no, no. You're, you. you're the guest of honor you're i'm a familiar face knows now. lauren <laughs> yeah <laughs> one of the owners of hiram and solomon cigars that my husband established uh eight, almost eight years ago uh briefly we even met through the cigar world He's goofing up right next year with playing with his phone, and, and I can hear the music. And I'm not too happy about it. So let's have fun tonight, and let's talk about cigars, life, beauty of meeting new people, also, and enjoy this evening. I'm very happy to meet you all, and whoever is behind the screen, also. Oh, absolutely huge pleasures, all mine. Um, and so let's start by. What is everybody smoking tonight? Um, I'm smoking Harman Solomon, The Revival. Uh, I smoked it now on purpose just to brag about it because <laughs> this happens to be my, my blend. It was my very first blend. And um, it just came like, by, not by accident, quite by, by choice. And uh, it was a very controversial uh, 
day for for the blenders at the factory and i insisted on a certain blend not because i wanted to be stubborn but i could see that those those tobaccos matching perfectly well and boom it worked so well it's one of our best selling cigars since we were here about women empowerment and talking about the women's month and that's what amanda and laura lauren was telling me previously just wanted to say that we are also very much involved in the blending. Not, and of course, we're going to talk about all the women involved in the factories, in the making of the cigars, and all that story. Voila. Awesome. Very lively. Fantastic. And what are you drinking too, by the way? I'm drinking a cognac. It's an Look Armenian. At that cognac. Glass. It's an Armenian cognac. It's called Ararat. I'm Armenian originally, and I just wanted to have a drink and. Maybe people want to know more about my origins. Here I am. I'm an Armenian, born in Lebanon, lived in London for quite some years, long years. And then I met my husband through the cigar, uh, cigar world on Instagram, typically like a millennial. I was 48 when I met him. So there we go. So we are married now, working together, left my life behind. I was a financial consultant. And I'm completely involved now in the new love and passion for cigars. I love That's it. A that's absolutely amazing. Real quick, I was watching you swirl that. It would be all over me. I'm just yeah. telling you that right now. You did that like so elegantly. I would have like, oh, like a helicopter. Just, I'd have been wearing No, you it. want to see what I usually do? And I love that. Look. Oh, that looks amazing. Oh, that's cool. Now you did it. <laughs> that is That's perfect. awesome. I gotta well, get gonna this cognac. Right? We're going to have to have you come on just for like a liquor show. Uh, <laughs> because like I said, I, I, I did that with a wine glass once and I ended up wearing a chunk. Maybe I filled the wine glass up too close to the rim, which is probably what probably, it is. Yeah. But uh, Lauren, what are you smoking tonight? So uh, in honor of Women's uh, History Month and uh, in honor of Romy and all the special guests that we have this month and next week as well. I'm smoking our Medallia special edition, which we did come out specifically for International Women's Day. Again, honoring all the women that are part of the cigar industry. Uh, they're such an integral part. And then also just the amazing women in our lives. So I am smoking the special edition. Awesome. Awesome. That's a great cigar, by the way. I, I am it. smoking the architect um or grand architect i'm sorry grand architect which, which is the sixth month. in the world of mason Freemason. yes uh this is the 660 i'm looking very forward to it and tonight i am drinking the axe and oak the official bourbon of the rocky mountain cigar show rye so we'll see how this goes together um sure to go together just great great cigar great alcohol great conversation uh so let's kind of just dive right into it here uh tell us a little bit about where you came from what brought you to the states um and then after that how did you get into cigars uh i'm gonna start from the last part of this question i was a cigar smoker from long long time ago the first time uh, as a kid, actually, the, the first memory of, you know, there's, there's a scent, there's a perfume that you always like. And I remember that I used to take my dad, who was a cigar smoker, the box of cigar back then, the tubos of Romeo and Juliet. Remember the Cuban, uh, they just mm -hmm. came with kind of an aluminum kind of thing and the cedar wrap and everything in there. I used to literally steal it, take it with me to school. And it was my comfort smell. I mean, opening the box. As a kid, I'm talking like five, six, seven year old, you know, there is that smell that is attracting me like, like a magnet, like a bee. And uh, I grew up quite some time just remembering that. And uh, when I first went to Cuba uh, in 1997, I guess, uh, we went to the tools, cigar tools, etc. And, you know, I took my first puff for real. It was all going back 27 years back of my life to the childhood, to the smell, to that scent and aroma that was subliminal, nothing real, until I had my first puff. And that was a love affair. Since then, I, I was living in London. And before that, I was living in Beirut. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, from an Armenian family. And uh, the only cigars we had was Cuban cigar, of course. Nobody smoked anything but Cuban 
in that part of the world until recently. And uh, again, uh, I thought I knew a lot about the cigars until I, I re rediscovered what the world of cigar was offering in the, in the entire world, except the Cubans were as good, but not as good as the rest of the world. I met my husband when I was in London. He thought I was an influencer. I just quoted something funny on a cigar post that our common friend had it, and I, I say hi to him, hi Randy, and I and he saw the comment and he thought it was commented on the specific, which was on Hiram and Solomon. I think it was a fellow craft. Long story short, my father was a mason. He was grandmaster at some time, and and we discussed and we started talking about masons, cigars, cognac, Armenian cognac in particular until I discovered that my husband behind the world, which was behind that screen we were talking, my husband-to-be was Armenian also, half Armenian, half Greek, born in Lebanon. Long story, one thing led to another, and we're married now, four years almost, <laughs> down the road. Up wow. Up so up. It ended up being like something that was very memorable for, for from you as a child. Uh -huh. Then you got to go to the birthplace for for lack of full story mm -hmm. uh birthplace of cigars cuba now i didn't know did you say how old you were please don't if you don't want to uh, yeah say how I'm, old you were? I'm 52 years young now oh no i was talking about when you young. smoked not currently i would never 27 understand. i was 27 my first okay. cigar and i smoked since then so you make this long 26 actually because it was 97 so yes i was 26 and it was the you know the the whole aroma and i got immediately attached to it i wouldn't say addicted because i still refuse that cigar make us sure, addicted. it's just the whole uh, uh, ritual that we are addicted to the ritual of cigar and not to the cigar itself or to the tobacco just to, to the tobacco itself Totally agree. And I just want to say, if you if you see me looking down at my phone, it's because I'm just hitting share, 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 share to get this to get this out. Okay. Um, so I don't mean to I'm not trying to be rude of any way. But oh, um, so so as you you came in, you're 27. Um, what talk us a little bit more as into what brought you to the States? Um, what did you start? what was life like when you first came here uh, and, and kind of how that experience was? Uh, well, when, when I first met Fouad, uh, it was again, totally about cigars. We were talking about, he thought I was a cigar influencer, which was not the case at all. I was still working. I was a financial consultant, uh, smoking my everyday cigar in my courtyard downstairs in London. Wait, you yeah volume completely so um he wanted to send me a cigar to post it i said hey my 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 instagram is private and nobody will know about it so i'm not an influencer. <laughs> i'm a smoker and i would love to smoke and when we started talking something was you know it's made in heaven or like the stars were all aligned for us to meet for whatever reason i didn't even know about his his ancestors, his background, whatever. But when I learned that he was Armenian, the whole conversation shifted to private, you know, like, where did you study? He studied in Beirut and I discovered all that. Long story short, he said, why don't you come to the States? I started really liking this guy. You know, I go like, why don't you come to London? I, <laughs> up I see a screenshot of his ticket. He was flying to London. I said, all right, this guy is crazy. Literally, I mean, who was that? He was flying all the way from, he was in Miami at the Black Smoke, I guess, right? He was at the Black Smoke yeah, Festival, and he went to New Jersey, changed his clothes into winter clothes because it was, it was cold in London, and then he flew back, he flew to London. I never knew that I wanted to ever not, you know, have a husband again, and um, one thing led to another. The minute I said goodbye to him at the airport after a few days, I booked my ticket and I sent him the screenshot. When he landed, he saw that I was coming to the States. <laughs> yeah, that what broke me. Uh, it it didn't take me much to decide that's it. I, I know I can, I'm, when you miss someone and you know that that's the only time in my life that I felt I was alone and lonely. I really felt that and I decided to, you know, to make things happen. 
it's one of my quotes that I really like. Like I like to make things happen. And, and absolutely, and, um, mover, and a sh- mover and a shaker. Two weeks after after we got married, which was <laughs> in February, and boom, it was COVID. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, things uh, were there to tell us whether we're going to survive COVID, you know, newly married. Two weeks after that, we were face to face, sitting all day long. And I go like, we're going to we're gonna lose the business. I mean, I, I was in, immediately involved in the business. I said, let's go to the, to the warehouse. We don't have employees. Nobody's coming. Let's move everything to the house. That's what we did. And we started working from home. The wow, of our smokers, everybody was happy. We were shipping, we were still sending the cigars. We even shipped our, I mean, everything we had, everything we had in stock. It was great. Wow, so, so first off, how long did he spend over there with you before you chased him back? <laughs> it sounds like you guys kind of crossed the world to go after That's each other. True. So, it was, it was 10 days he spent it there. And the thing is, I always say that to my friends also, like uh, when you're in a relationship, we tend to put on makeup on that relationship. We tend to make it always seem too pretty, too gorgeous. Everything seems perfect because we do not share the bad side of a guy, Mm -hmm. which happened probably in my previous relationship when one person and every single friend of mine told me, that's a bad, that's so bad. And I used to lie. No, 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 you don't understand. That's not the right, that's not the way you should see it. It wasn't that way. When I met Fuad, long after I, I was done with that relationship, I decided no, no more, nothing at all. I, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm, I'm very fine with my career. And, and I met Fuad and I introduced him to my friends. They used to call me Rogue Romy. They used to call me Thug Romy. I was that <laughs> bad. I was the badass in, in other words and they told me you're not leaving this guy this is the guy this is you and to make things clearer i told my sister i have only one sister i told my sister uh, a few months after i met Fuad, i said i'm getting married i didn't say i think i didn't say i'm i'm in a relationship i said i i'm getting married and she goes what wait why him? She didn't even know who it was. She said, <laughs> why it was him? And I, it didn't take me much. I said to her, he is me. He is me. He's like, I'm looking. Maybe it's narcissistic to say that, but it was like me in the mirror, masculine, feminine, the female and the male. You know, that was exactly why I loved God that much. You know, everything about us was like, you know, it, it's, it's clicking. It's just fitting so well perfectly well and I'm, 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 I can't wait it was a perfect decision for both sides anyway he said the same thing over and over and again about this whole, the whole relationship so he was right from the beginning the yin to your yang and you were unwilling to let that go and you chased him back he I chased did. you first you then followed up and I, now we are where we are and you guys yeah. have been together married for four years you have oh a cigar God. company together looks like you have a beautiful home as well uh from just what i'm looking at right here we made and- this room only for cigar <laughs> <There's-> <laughs> <laughs> sure that we had the cigar room from the beginning it's our everyday ritual doesn't matter we're drinking coffee here we have friends here it just it's our little cocoon, you know. Oh, that's amazing. I need a room yeah. like that. <laughs> Just let me know. I'll let you know. But, you know, I got even these because it's quite cold. And this is like what they use for the yachts. Oh. So we got this guy. He came, took the measurement. It's completely insulated because we can have cold winters in New Jersey. Nothing. We just sit here. Look what I'm wearing. It doesn't matter. You, you don't need anything. Just put the fire. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, that is so nice. Yeah. My husband. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of. <laughs> well, the Bible. So, so let yeah. me ask you, what's the weather like in Armenia? I, I, I've never I met haven't somebody been to personally. Armenia. I have not been. I was born in Lebanon. Oh, that's right. I, Lebanon. 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 Le- Lebanon, the weather is Mediterranean. It's quite nice and mild. And uh, we have four, we used to have four seasons. Perfect, nice weather. 
beach, snow, everything. It's Lebanon being the only country probably in the Middle East that do not have any desert. So it's it's like I would say it's like San Diego. You know, it's just okay. mild climate. Always uh, you, you don't have extreme heat except probably in August. It's a little humid, but that's about it. If people know whether of Cyprus or Israel, it's just that part of the Mediterranean. Okay, so coming to Jersey then, the winters weren't a shock. No, I came to Jersey from London, in fact, and not from Lebanon, because I was in London for all those years. I moved to London uh, for work, for uh, pursuing my career over there. And uh, the weather in London was, again, like my personality. I, I always, They always told me, what do you like about London? I go like, the weather. I love the weather <laughs> in London. Just shut up. I love that weather. Waking up in the gloomy sky is the most poetic. I'm not too, too romantic, but London was the best weather for me. I like that, you know, damp and nice weather. So, yes, I have not been to Armenia yet. So, and forgive me for that. I, I, yeah, you're Armenian in Lebanon. I, uh, I, I missed that. So, forgive me for that. But, no. So, what is the difference is coming weather wise to New Jersey? Was, was that a shock for you? Was, was there anything or were you? Um, the weather wise, no, not really. New Jersey is beautiful, in fact, in, in terms of weather. It's, really beautiful we can always smoke our cigars that's how we compare everything <laughs> we, we need to have the good weather where it's cold i haven't seen much snow yet it didn't happen since i moved here you know things are quite mild in london the weather is quite cold so i'm used to the cold mm -hmm. it's yeah. also genetic having armenian genes so I'm, I, I'm i'm a survivor probably of multiple generations in the cold so one of the oldest uh, civilizations armenians are still existing from the Torah time, from the biblical time. So, yeah, we survived quite cold weathers, and I guess I have it in my genes that are like I was in New Jersey. Uh, culturally, it was a little different. We walk in London. We do way more things that we can do here. Here, everything has to be planned because of distances. Uh, we're not too far from New York. We're just an hour, 15 hour, 10 minutes from the city, which, which is quite okay all right for us we do go to the city almost once a week or twice sometimes and pretty much yeah the only thing i miss london is i mean my friends of course the life we have there is pretty much different from here we have the pub life so everything happens after work we mm -hmm. don't go home we're either in a pub having a pint or just there to talk with friends outside and uh, the first time i visited london he was shocked he thought that was like there was kind of a uh, a protest happening because outside the pubs on the street where the cars are passing you have 200 human beings and then the car comes everybody moves the car moves and then they go back on the on the asphalt so it's just a normal life in those little streets of london that what we miss here we, we have only one pub in the area where we live here and i don't see anyone there ever you know they don't have the pub culture and after that we usually go home i used to have a nice courtyard so i used to smoke my cigar there and on any given day we're out doing museums doing uh, the park we walk to walk here yeah, no we just drive and drive <laughs> well <laughs> Well, am I right in saying probably one of the first things that you notice, be that you are uh, as big as the cigar smokers you are, is the cost of cigars over here to oh, England is like oh my gosh, like Big a difference. quarter of the cost. The cost was was pretty much uh, high, and also lack of uh, choice, may I say, because you know I I probably smoke five brands out of which three were my favorite. I used to smoke for every day, a Hoyo, uh, Epicur Dos, uh, and uh, I used to love, really, I say I used to because I'm not enjoying it anymore because of the raw problem, the Trinidad, Lancero, it's really disappointing now, but that was my favorite and definitely uh, Partagas uh, oh, yeah. 32, I, I, D, D, and D4, and uh, I used to love those cigars. Now I smoke them and I go like, 
you know, you think you know something until you discover your your new world, they call it. And pretty much in London, everybody is now enjoying also the non-Cuban, which is uh, really like reading the same author all your life until you discover, wait a minute, there are other people who can write books and, and take you to, to another journey of uh, in the world of, of reading, same as the cigar. So what was the first New World cigar that you ever tried? I remember so long. Oh, um, okay. So let me say I smoked a Davidoff. And, that, you know, that's the only thing you would find in London. Otherwise, it was going to be in the gas station. So whatever was non-Cuban, apart from the Davidoff, it was a non-Cuban in a gas station. So people really related that to cheap a cheap product in terms of, I mean, how can I say? Like they didn't know the value of having a non-Cuban cigar. Recently, right. the ratio has gone way higher than it was. When I was there, like I said, it was zero, literally zero. It was Davidoff or Cuban. And then it started changing. I'm talking about the famous places like uh, in Mayfair, in, in, in the areas where you would find a nice cigar lounge, or a store that sells good cigars. And my first non-Cuban, again, was Davidoff, but then really from the new world, you might say, it was Hiram Solomon that Fuad brought with him when he visited me after we started uh, talking on, on Instagram. So I wanted to ask you, have you ever, there's a really famous Davidoff lounge, uh, father, son, oh, yeah, I can't uh, yeah. remember the name. Yes. And, Have you been and, there? Oh, yeah. It, there? it was walking distance from my house 10, 12 minutes. Oh, perfect. Wow. That's and like a walking, walking distance shop. there, right? It, when you're in central London, you just have to cross one of the parks and you're just there. <laughs> we, we walk. We, we walk there. Like six, seven. I mean, four miles was an average of walking every day. Here we drive. Wow. If I walked four miles every day, <laughs> I would be wearing a lot smaller clothes. Um, so, yeah, I, I should be walking about four miles every day. Um, so, you're you're here in the U.S. You've got a cigar company. It's COVID. What was COVID like for you guys? Is it was obviously you had mentioned that you were afraid you weren't going to be able to keep the company. You clearly pulled that off. But what was that initial conversation kind of around bringing everything into the house, like you said? Yeah. Um, what was the, what was some of the main concerns? It was it was a dire strait, let me say that. Like a decision that was, it's like a Russian roulette decision. You just shoot either works or you just kill yourself. Literally, that's how it worked. We were discussing. Fuad was, and he's is a very optimistic person. He was not in, in Lebanon during the war, so he lived pretty much all his life in the United States. He was here, he's here now for 35 years. So 31 years when COVID happened, he was in the United States. He was more optimistic. He's never been through this much of disappointment. Or I, I was I was very pessimistic from the minute it started. Because I I could see it turning global and I go like, no, 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 this is not a matter of one day, two weeks one month, two months, and it was just growing, right? And I said, we need to do something, I guess. And people were calling. There was not yet the full lockdown uh, in, 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 in all the industry, I mean, in all the businesses. There were some businesses still working, but people were starting to call, like, do you know any lounge open? You know, and a lot of people were smoking. This was way before we all went on to Zoom meetings or Zoom groups and all that. The, the thing was we had to always go and check on the cigars at the warehouse because you need to check the humidity, you need to check that everything is okay. The worst maybe decision, I mean, the most critical decision we had to take is when we had to send payment to the factory and that was a big payment to be made. Mm -hmm. And they had the cigars ready there, but we had to send the money and we didn't know when the product came here. What are we going to do with all that product, right? Is it going to go on like this? We're going to keep it at the warehouse, at the, at, the, at the port facility. We didn't know. We just said, let's do it. Let's do it. We, you know, 
it's one thing if everybody thinks like let's close the business you know many businesses they didn't believe in it yeah. and it closed unfortunately yeah and people were very much encouraging us like hey guys you know, we want to smoke 10 cigars and that's what we did and many of the manufacturers over here can agree with me like we sold more cigars during covid than any other time yeah there yeah there was a big, a big boom, boom during that time the people were staying at home uh the wives couldn't complain anymore because you know she wants her husband uh, to have also some some quality time quiet time uh, i mean all day being at home is not an easy easy task you know one on one with children in the house studying at home everything was just you, you have to start readapting yourself to the new life to the new uh condition you know if we didn't we're eight billion almost in this world we went through a lot of things through a lot of pandemic sort of if you want to believe in the pandemic so yeah we did survive all that so why not this pandemic and you know i i lived a very nasty war as a as a ch child where in beirut Fuad lived it too it was a militia war it was a street war it was a civil war and a civil war is usually personal care about civil war. so we went like kittens from one house to another house moving from one one town to another town my entire family fled to the United States. They migrated to the United States, legal uh, immigration back then, and they made their life. My dad decided to stay in Lebanon because of his business, and we had to suffer somehow from the war. And that was like another another obstacle in your life. It's You either decide to break it or you just fall before it breaks you. Yeah. I mean, from what you're telling me, because I at first, like, I... I you know, you said you uh, moved around a lot, and I always thought it was difficult to move on the other side of the country. I did that before, but I couldn't imagine moving to another uh, to another country. But it sounds like your life experiences kind of gave you like a high chaos tolerance. It did. Actually, I woke up one day in Japan after literally 48 hours knocked out because I flew that week on three different continents. And, and that's one of the days I said, I think it's way too much, you know, enough is enough. It's just like you don't realize uh, how short is life. And, you know, sometimes you make a wish and boom, it happens. You know, it just works. And I, I wanted to stop doing it. I was working as a financial consultant from when I was 23. I had two beautiful boys. My boys are also quite smokers now. They enjoy the cigars and they, they're... We're discussing about, you know, doing this as a family business eventually. Maybe one of the neo, neo, uh, neo, how do you call it? Like the new families in the industry because there are beautiful families, ancestors coming from 100 or 150 years in the industry, people. And maybe we'll be the first family that is doing this as a family. Like Amanda's dad started, Amanda Mikalos, who put us together today, by the way. And hi, Amanda, if you're listening. <laughs> no, that's 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 awesome. I, I, I love the family aspect um, because cigars is a lot of the family. You become family with friends that you smoke cigars with. So, yeah. you know, like going to the Great Smoke last week, I even I said this in the post when I posted about it. A lot of these people were friends on Facebook that became family within days. Yeah, you know, I and not married. Not yeah, <laughs> literally, literally creating families here. Um, Absolutely. But, well, it's so interesting because like cigars themselves are so heaped in tradition, and so it's you know family's just an extension of that. So you're creating your own tradition, your own values, and then your own legacy. So that's really cool. That's right. So you're getting some shout outs here from Bruce that's about that. Bruce, yes. <laughs> now that, that's that's really, really good uh, stack of dimes you got going out there. You're holding it like per you like trying uh to like me, I, I it doesn't matter how I hold it, it always ends up on my lap. Um so, but but I do want to ask a question, uh, because uh your husband uh, it, it said that he would like to know the answer to this. Now, it's a little bit of a funny question, but so what came first, your love of Hiram and Solomon or your love of your husband? <laughs> Is that the bill I know, Bill Schaefer? Yes. yes. Yeah. No, no, it was for Fuad, definitely, definitely. 
definitely. I knew it the moment. I, I mean, the moment we said goodbye at the airport, I can go on for hours about how things were always uh, aligned for us to, to go further in the relationship. Another, uh, it's not an, uh, let's say another event that happened. The day I, 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 you know, he was going to the airport, I said, all right, let's go to the airport. I took him to the airport. We got there. Believe it or not, you know, the security before the gate, You once you pass the security, you're not allowed unless you have a boarding pass. For whatever reason, we still don't know that secret. I got with him all the way to the desk of the security, of the TSA, the equivalent of TSA over here. And they're checking. The, the lady who was there, she said, you can go with him. I still don't know how I was at the gate with him that day. No boarding pass. I didn't cheat. I didn't say I have a boarding pass. I just went through that all the way to the gate. That happened only 30 years ago, I guess. Nothing after that, right? I said, yeah, 9 11 changed that. It's just weird. And it's an international flight, not an internal flight. He was flying back to New Jersey from Heathrow Airport. It, it, I've traveled Heathrow Airport. It's one of the highest security. And I don't even know how I ended up at the gate. We hugged each other. We said goodbye. And I knew that moment, like, wait. These are like weird signs, you know. I start believing in those things like a teenager, which, um, you know, like a, a gen, a millennial, let me say, <laughs> a 48 year old millennial that back then. And I was like, this, if this is not meant to happen and I can't see it, so why else am I even seeing this guy? Why am I talking with this guy? I'm very pragmatic in life, very realistic, and I could see things like perfectly aligned, you know? I, I like squares in my life, so yeah, that was a perfect square. <laughs> but in the relationship, it was, a, it was a circle. No beginning, no end. I felt like I've always known for art. That's fantastic. And, and you guys came together, crossed worlds uh, uh, to come together. And, you know, my parents didn't cross worlds, but it's sort of similar. They met in high school. My mom moved down to Florida. My grandfather had a restaurant that opened for, I think, only like eight months. It got shut down for whatever reason. I mean, my mom was 17 and my mom uh, ended up coming back to Illinois Within a month or so, she flew back down to Florida, finished out her high school career with my dad, and then she dragged my dad from Florida back up to Illinois. So it was at least cross country, but it was like they kind of both chased each other around in that extent that nobody was willing to give the other one up. Yeah. Um, so, well, you know, your brand carries a lot closeness to me. My granddad was uh high high mason it was a 33rd i think is the highest or 32nd um he was the i, I say grand Puba because i don't know what it, the high one is called uh -huh. um but he was grand Puba at the lounge several times throughout his life he started the lounge uh or started the uh lodge i should say the lodge, yes the lodge in ocala florida was one of the founding members he was a masonic before that but brought it to ocala uh put it right next to the church i grew up right next to the building every single summer we would go and i would look and um so when i first saw both you and your husband on an instagram I had never heard of you guys before. This was a year or so ago, two years ago at this point. And the emblem right away, the Masonic symbol on the inside of it, just drew me in. Uh, I actually have my granddad's Masonic rings. I have the Demolay, the kid stuff that my dad wore. I have my granny's. I forgot what the theme, what the ladies' version of it was called. Yes. Star. Yeah, so I have I have her stuff. Uh, like it was really involved. Eventually, I will love to get into it uh, to join the lodge and be part of that culture. But when he passed, my granddad, since he was the founding member of the one in Ocala, he pretty much said, "You are to take." I guess this is not supposed to happen. I, I hope I don't get anybody in trouble. I doubt anybody's watching that cares, but. Uh, I actually got brought into the main ceremonial room and they let me sit in the head chair uh, and they were like, your granddad 
made us like promise that we would show you this because he really wants you to be involved in it. And he wanted you to feel the magic of the room. The It, it has a life of its own, that room. There's an energy in that room with the altar in the front and the big and the book. And, uh, and then all the chairs placed around. Uh, and then that big one just right there. So I got to sit in it. They told me he, he sat in that chair several times over his life. And uh, and then they unsealed his file, and which I get again. This is apparently you're not supposed to do this. They unsealed his file and they gave me the very first picture he ever took at the lodge oh. that was on the wall. And well, on the and, yes, salute. And uh, may God bless his soul. Yeah, that's what it was just overwhelming to feel that energy. Uh, in that room and have everybody around. He was also um, uh, Scottish right, and uh, which is very closely tied to the Masons as well. No, he's a Mason. It's a group. It's a subgroup of a Mason. You can't be a Scottish right if you're not a Mason. Correct. Correct. And so the, he had the bagpipes at his funeral. Like it was, it was remarkable. And so when I saw this, I instantly went online, found what I could find, and I, I smoked it. And I smoked it in his honor because we never smoked cigars together. He was a pipe smoker. And it really, really meant a lot to me um, to have that experience. and something that could bring me back. So my question to you is, and that ash just keeps getting I'm gonna ask nicer. Oh, come on. You got to go to the whole show. The whole show. She's, she's a pro, but it's like you're flirting yeah, with yeah. it a bit. Like it might I just it might drop any second. <laughs> I know. I almost want to like reach through the screen and be like, come on. <laughs> so um, where is the connection? Walk us through the connection with the Masonic side of the, of the brand. What made you guys even start that? And also, did you ever get any kind of pushback from the Masonic platform, either in Europe or America or wherever else uh, they might be? All right. To start with, also, we got married in the lodge, in a Masonic lodge, it, it, the lodge where my husband belongs to. So that's also our marriage. Our wedding ceremony was held at the lodge of, of Fuad. So, yes, it started... Fuad being a Freemason for now almost 20, oh, more than 25 years, 27 years now, yes. And uh, he was very devoted, very active, and he always believed in the ethics and in all the values that the Mason, a Freemason, has for himself, to the fraternity, and to the whole world. Again, uh, funny enough that I, I just happened to be the daughter of a Freemason, in a totally different part of the world where it's a completely secret society. It's not revealed. Nobody says I'm a Freemason in that part of the world. Same as in Europe, by the way. But Masons are quite a, uh, a silent society. They wouldn't come out and tell you, hey, I'm a Freemason. They wouldn't, defer, even if you ask them. And even until now, you don't ask people in Europe whether or not he's a brother, a traveling man, etc. In the United States, it is a totally different thing. People are very open, very proud. Everybody's proud to be a Freemason. But then again, again, there was reason, there were reasons why in that part of the world it was completely a secret society. Anyway, to talk about how it started, Fuad belonging to that lodge, they needed some money for scholarship for some student in difficulty. And they decided to do something, a small thing, like many people do now, like they want to do their cigars. And they go to a factory, they paid tremendously high price for not knowing anything. So they bought the cigars. They made a charity evening. They sold the cigars. They were sold out. And you know, uh, I have to say that to the non-Masons here, Freemasons are pretty much tied to the cigar ceremony and pretty much all the lodges had a before or after meeting a certain cigar uh, evening. I mean, people used to smoke cigars and lots of lodges, they had even their own little room, cigar room. And when they saw that first batch, other lodges not far, they heard about that successful event or evening and they wanted to to do another night thinking like cigar or fuad was in the industry. 
Fuad said, I know nothing about the business. I have just did this. I've done this and it's just for uh, for that charity. And they said, all right, do us another, please, another batch. From the first batch of 5,000 cigar. No, wait, not 5,000. 1,000 cigar. The first one was 1,000. The next one was 5,000 from charity, purely charity. And Fuad was in the gas station business and the gas distribution business. So that was another business he had. And he loved it because, again, the charity, uh, finding the names, creating more cha more charitable events for, for the fundraising was becoming quite addictive to him. One thing led to another. We are l almost a little less than a million cigar a year now after eight years in the industry. So, yes, we are uh, working hard and we're growing much faster than we were expecting. I called ourselves a premature baby in the industry because that premature baby sometimes you're not sure is going to survive or not in our case that premature baby again thank god it survived the baby survived and uh, started even walking at the age of six months and talking at the age of eight months and boom we are running after that child now you know the baby is a is quite a genius we're never resting by the way we always think like we haven't done anything yet we thank all the people who believed in us, all the lounges, all the retailers that really believed in us, especially in the beginning where, where Fuad had to go and you know tell them, hey, we just started this. In the beginning, many people thought it was just a, an anecdote, a gimmick, or just like whatever people do when they say, oh, I just rolled my cigars, I made my cigars because I didn't find any good cigars in the world. That's not true. That's There are thousands of great cigars over there, even the ones that come from a little atelier, a little factory in, in, in the world. Uh, the Freemasons, uh, Fuad being also a past master, uh, he made everything through the right channels. He took the permissions from all the, I mean, from the lodges, from the Grand Lodge. And when they believed in him and the, they gave him the proper authorization to go with it, things started becoming more serious and, uh, and and a lot of people thought Masons themselves, like we don't want people to use the Mason as a business. But until now, we are mainly involved in the charity and we do, of course, we do our profit. We're not here to do just charity, but we're doing the charity equally to the, to the business. And uh, the third cigar, the fourth cigar was called the Shriner. And I need to talk about the Shriner as, as being, Shriners are another division of the Freemasons. You're only a Shriner if you're a Freemason. You join the Shriners, you join the Scottish Shrine. So uh, the Shriners uh, have hospitals around the world, free for everybody, for Masons and non-Mason children. For, uh, they have their trauma centers and they have the for orthopedic centers for for like devastated countries where they they would bring the child and the family treat them here in the United States or in Mexico they have hospitals here in Canada in Mexico correct me if I'm wrong and they send them back to their country completely free and our, our shiner uh, some of the proceeds of our shiner cigar go to the to the to the Shriners Hospital. Now we are rolling special cigars for the Grand Masters of different states. So we are up to three cigars in New Jersey, North Carolina, Georgia, Arkansas is coming soon. And the proceed we just donated $10,000 and another $10,000 in New Jersey for the volume of our company, for the, the age of the company. You might think, what is $10,000? But then you realize, wait a minute, they're only babies. They're only eight-year-old cigars. Bill likes our Shriner, he said. So, yeah, we're, we're puppies, but we're, we're quite bullish in, in, in that. Eventually, our target, I can see the question coming. Our main goal, our dream, may I say, is to create a, a certain philanthropic aspect of this whole business and turn it into that. We're getting there. We're still young, but we're getting there. So the Shriners, by the way, uh, love the Shriners. What a fantastic, selfless, in, in every sense of the word, organization. Um, it's a complete 
voluntary charity for nobody's forced to be in the Shriders. They do it because they just love the charitable giving, but it's for kids. Uh, at, pro, uh, at least from what I know of Shriders, it's, it, they do so much for children. Circuses, they have the biggest circus event that they do. I know. They dress up like clowns. I yeah, know. That's, that's the event itself, but they do also, they visit the hospitals. These are people who have their life, their businesses, regardless. For them, being a Shriner is being a, a voluntary clown to make people happy. And it takes a lot of their time. I wish people really realize the value of, of, of them giving. They travel. They travel the world to just do those. You know, every hospital is not just in one state and all the Shriners are in that state. No, no. There are Shriners. There are no Shrine Hospital in, uh, I don't know, in, in uh, Kentucky or in, in uh, Arkansas. But they travel. The Shriners from that state will travel to another state just to be able to take care of those children and make yeah them and, and they also help kids get to the hospital oh, to yeah. be able to get that surgery and you know my my sister didn't go through shriners and it's not important the charity that she did because we're talking about shriners uh, and that's what we'll stay on but it was like having my sister get the help that she needed being able to pay for lodging like it was just such a uh burden relief off of their shoulders so like thank you very much from the bottom of my heart all the children that you guys support it it truly is a selfless organization um that has a little bit of mystique but has a, it's a selfless organization nonetheless and in fact my granddad explained the shriners as the party arm of the lodge he said that the lot the masonics were the ritual side and stuff like that he goes then you get the striders you just go out and have a good time like it's just it's 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 clowns like you said it's playing around it's having a good show so it's just it's amazing that you know the, the masons started super secret society uh very much underground up team whatever years ago and they've evolved into a public face that at least here in the states but not just that but a giving arm of this quote unquote secret society and like it is it is absolutely fantastic and i commend you both for being part of it uh and that's it's absolutely fantastic um, three million dollars a day is collected for the shriners donated actually in the, to the shriners every single day it's wow. one of the biggest organizations just for charity again. Just wow. for the well being of those kids. That is insane. That is awesome. I I love that. That and all those families that you all help and you do it in a way where it's it's the organization, but it's not like public public. Like, yeah, you guys you you guys do raise money, but there's other organizations that put a bigger spotlight on that and you guys kind of do it in a way that puts more emphasis on the help than the organization. Does that make sense? Like it, you, it realize, shows you realize that really every little helps. When when they reach out, sometimes we receive an email at least three, four times a day, just emails about certain uh, help we can, even if it's a box of cigar they need to auction or to donate for an event. Not necessarily for a Masonic event. Sometimes it's a, it's a lady who is just you know co connected to a Mason. Her father, or grandfather was a Mason. She has no idea, but she knows that if she reaches to Sahara and Solomon cigars, that they have a little uh, school uh, problem and they need to collect a little money. They do a special event, a small event maybe, just donate the cigar. We do it with love and and we love. Like I said, it made us look beyond our business today i mean every time and every day maybe we talk about it that when when will the day come and then we will just sit there and think about how big we are in the philanthropic aspect of this business and not just the business and uh, the, the, you know oops i love oh it. <laughs> that's better than i could have ever done that's uh... yeah. 
Here we are, 49 minutes into the cigar, everybody, and the ash was on. I don't yeah. think I've made it past like an inch, and I'm waiting. <laughs> so I, I, I commend you for that. Uh, if you know, so I'm part Greek as well. I know I really don't look like it, but my mom's maiden name was Tamaris. Uh, my brother looks much more Greek than I do. Um, but uh, so I, I do the whole I talk with my hands and my arms. You watch my grandfather talk, it's always this or. You yes. know, so I, I, I've absorbed that. From my the grandma was Greek. My husband is, my, his dad is Greek. His mom is Armenian. So, yes, we have those Greek genes. <laughs> very much involved in that. So I wanted to, uh, you had mentioned that over in Europe, the Masons are a little bit more on the secret side. You know, here in this, like, I have my granddad's ring and he wore it. Like, it, it it's not that here. Like, people here are, like, loud and proud. Uh, they do everything but like wear a Masonic, or they even have Masonic ball caps. Now, what am I talking about? No, we have it on the car, or even you have. Yeah, that. yeah, the license plate. We were know? in Sweden uh, just before COVID, maybe, and uh, and Fuad likes to visit all the lodges, you know, wherever he is, and it's a big, uh, it's kind of a passion, you know. Uh, and he was asking people. We went to one event that was made by a Freemason uh, for Masons, and it's a, it, it was in a lounge, a cigar lounge. Fuad, coming from the United States, here in the United States, every time he asked, "Do we have any Masons over here? Any Freemasons in the, in the lounge, wherever we are?" Whoever is a Mason is, you know, typically, yeah, hey, we are here, brothers. We're in Sweden. The organizer was a Freemason. Everybody was a Freemason. Nobody said a word. All of oh, a sudden, that's crazy. Like, you, there was nothing. There was like one of those most silent silences ever, you know, like a TV moment of silence where everything makes you uncomfortable. And, and he went like, all right, let's smoke. And he was talking about <laughs> And he's 100% true because we know that the distributor, our distributor in Sweden, is a Freemason. And, and he said that's going to be an event for the Freemasons. Now, long story, after the event was over and everybody was saying goodbye, and the minute I just disappeared and I was, like, leaving, everybody was coming to him, shaking hands with him, brother, blah, blah, blah. And he was shocked. He was like, but why? And then uh, they explained that even themselves, knowing each other, they will not talk about it unless they're in the lodge. Nothing. So if you Google... Grand Lodge of Sweden, I I can, no, Sweden. The Grand Lodge of Sweden doesn't have an address. <coughs> it's not sure, it doesn't pop up. Yeah, it's quite uh, funny to have that. Yeah, it, it's nothing. No address. There is no such thing as the Grand Lodge of Sweden, which is a very big lodge, but not even on Google. They could even surpass and bypass Google on that. There is no Grand Lodge of Sweden with an address when you Google it. So you know how big is that keeping it a top secret, I mean, under underground or um, undercover society. So over here, you get, like, I've been bluntly asked by other friends that are Masons or people that I know that are Masons, hey, do you want to come to it? Does that not happen? Is it like a, like a, like you get a letter in the mail, like blacked yeah. out, that no, self-destructs? Uh, no, like no, no. And the motto of the Masons, one of the motto is to to be one, ask one. And that's why you find it on uh, our, some of our cigars, most of our cigars. It says two, number two, be one, SK, ask one. You can't, uh, you can't invite people to become Masons. They should come to you and ask you about the brotherhood. And you will, of course, tie them with the, with a mentor, with someone who can, who can lead you because becoming a Mason is not a, uh, uh, it's not a party. It's not a political party. It's n nothing, none of that. It's a lot of devotion. You need to work hard. You need to be ready to evolve and you need to be ready to put yourself, be to put everybody else before yourself. It's a big devotion. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work. And uh, again, I love it. I love to see my husband surrounded with the brothers and i consider i have like millions of brothers around the world again coming from a family from a daughter of a freemason who was completely undercover but i knew it from the house because a lot of the meetings during the war in lebanon they couldn't go to the lodges 
the meetings were held in in the house but it was all like we never knew what was really happening there and and uh, like i said for us is a big devoted like every mason is devoted mason. there is no mason who is not totally devoted well looks like you got a standing offer filed uh by the way am i saying <laughs> that correct i hate what Ms. what uh Fouad. if you're ever in north carolina Fouad, uh yeah, larry wants you to come and visit <laughs> Yes, uh, absolutely. At the, at the lodge out there. So, mm -hmm. um, so obviously here I'm in the states, the cigar of North Carolina Grandmaster. This is the cigar was made for the charity of the Grandmaster of North Carolina last year. Oh, oh wow! wow. Okay, cool. so, uh, so since you brought in the your product a little bit, what you made last year. Uh, without getting too much into detail, or at least not divulging anything you don't feel comfortable with, yeah. tell us a little bit about where your cigars are made, um, how you guys develop your blends, and um, if you have anything new coming out on the market this year, and, and when can people find it? Well... It started uh, with, uh, we started rolling at the Placencia factory until COVID started and we were doing, uh, maybe I should also, just before going to the detail of our cigars, uh, I have to highlight also the fact that we do cigars and we were the first people to, to create a cigar for the warriors. And, we, you know, the Cigar for Warriors was created just... 100% of the proceeds of that cigar was supposed to go to the Cigar for Warriors Association. And they do a lot of work, hard work. We take pride in that. We did that with such love, such uh, passion, because we know how, how precious is the freedom we have because of those young people fighting for our freedom everywhere in the world. And uh, they used to send cigars. They had the cigar boxes, if you remember. I mean, they still do that mm -hmm. and they asked us to create a cigar for them and we did that at the at the pdr factory it was our second cigar there and uh, it was a big success again and when we started having uh COVID issues and we were kind of worried about what's happening in nicaragua because of the lockdown lockdown was a big issue there and then right after that the hurricane came and we started creating other cigars in a different just not to put all your eggs in one basket, may I say. So we shifted to Dominican. I started rolling different blends in the Dominican uh, as, a, as a, just, a, you know, to have a variety. Recently, we moved to PDR. All our production is now made in Dominican Republic in Santiago Tamboril at the PDR factory, a very famous factory. And the PDR cigars of Ape Forest are yep. really great cigars also. So we moved there. We are now um, launching our core line that used to be rolled in Nicaragua. But the whole blend, uh, the Placencia people were very uh, noble. Uh, and they sent all the blends, all the details of the blends to, to, to a Flores. And, and they even wow. said, whatever tobacco you cannot find, we're ready. Because they're the biggest owners of tobacco. Yeah. Uh, and they were, like I said, they were noble enough to send all the details, of course, and the tobacco if needed from their own stock. So yes, wow, thanks to to their uh, chivalry. That is amazing. So now we roll our cigars at the PDR. We we have almost sixteen different blends, and three new blends that I was there with Fuad last week, and we just came back. We made an amazing trio that's going to be uh another like a next step what you call it you know you you just go up the ladder step by step and the new one is going to be an amazing uh new series every cigar we do we do it with uh, with serious thinking and deep thinking of what just not us you know it's not just me myself and i kind of business it's just what people love we listen when we roll the cigar for the Grandmaster, we first want to know about his motto, about his idea, what, what he wants to call the cigar. Like some of them, uh, Kuramus was the first cigar, uh, the second cigar actually. Unity was the first cigar that was rolled for the Grandmaster of 
New Jersey. And unity was right during COVID, what people needed to be in unity. In, 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 in. We needed all that, right? And he said unity. So we go like, what? Unity, unity it is. And it went great. And the next one was Kuramus. Again, was right during COVID also, the long, endless years of COVID. So Kuramus, uh, I made a lot of researches. In Latin means we care for each other. And that was their motto, we care. We, we heal each other by being together. And that's how it started uh, growing. Now, the new cigars, the new blends that are coming, they're going to be... Uh, we have Arkansas coming. We can, we have what else? We can make it, uh, Pennsylvania Grand Lodge is uh, also asking for cigars. We do donate. It's clear, obvious on the books. Nothing that we talk about. It's it's literally existing. The revival that I'm smoking here, Larry, and uh, what in North Carolina? Yes. Uh, see, everybody likes the revival because I wrote, I blended it. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just discovered recently that I do have a palette that can create blends, and that was what the factory told me. They said, "Please let's let's stick to your choices because it's working quite well, and uh, it's uh, matching uh, people's uh, taste and people's uh, imagination." In other words. That's crazy. I just feel like you just hit the ground running as soon as you guys open. I mean, 16 I blends, three more. Like, you, w do you sleep at all? <laughs> we, when we go to the Dominican, which was recently because of the Pro Cigar Festival, one of the most beautiful festivals that, if you've never been to the Dominican, just try to go to that festival. It's amazing. They do it, such, a, such an organized whole festival is great. But we work from 7.30 in the morning and because of the festival, after the whole factory day, we blend, we decide on, on the blend, we decide on the packaging, we decide on that, and then we go to the party. Never come back <laughs> home until 2 a.m. And, and I, I just go all the way, like, let's party. So we go party and then we come back 7.30 in the morning, we're back at the factory doing cigars smoking cigars at seven at eight i don't lie at eight they serve us breakfast there <laughs> and then boom we're blending 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 and it became like a family thing now you know most of the uh, rollers uh don't speak a word of english you have to have with the sign language and amazingly they're so devoted they're so professional these guys they grew up in the business you know they just look at you with with your hand wherever you're talking i'm sometimes talking to abe a for the owner or to fuad and just telling them what i like what i'm not liking much the guy doesn't speak a word of english but he knows because of you know in passion you don't need words you know just need to see the sign and boom they go and come back all right we added the coroho we removed this coroho we added some pennsylvania here because you know it gives a kick uh, and and like I said, it's all about science. It's all about the passion, how you translate it. And it's, so far, it's working quite well. Well, the one thing I can say is passion is not something you lack. Yes. Um, I can see it from the start of this interview until right now, and I've seen it in all your videos, you and Faud, uh, have just amazing, amazing passion for cigars. Um, so... Are you gonna ask? So do you are do you know how to roll? Not no, not really. No. I haven't rolled. I mean you mean physical roll, right? No, not yet. Is that something that's on your bucket list to do is be able to uh funny enough, every time we take people with us to visit the factory or we see I mean every time there is someone with us, can I roll? Can I roll? I go, yeah, go ahead. I've never tried. I know I would be able if I wanted, I mean, if I watched someone doing it out of passion, but looking at those ladies and, and, and men doing all that work, it's, it's astonishing. You know, I still, I can't go to the museum and look at the painting and I go, I can do this. You know, that's how I look at every cigar roller. They are artists. They are painters. They are they have the talent, you know, it's the way they bunch the cigar, the way they 
they, they the, the bunch of the, the tobacco, they know which one to take away. And it, it just weird, you know. It, it they like in their own world. It's like all of them that are autistic, I call it, you know, an autistic has its own world. In the moment they're on that table, maybe I'm exaggerating, I'm too passionate the way I'm talking, but really, it's not really, every stick looking at it and thinking of how many hands go through this. And, and that's why when somebody complains about the cigar, even after the COVID, we had all the factories, they had some issues with a cool, I mean, some, some of them, they were a little loose, some of them, they were a little too tight. Every factory had it. A lot of rollers were not coming to the factory. A lot of employees were afraid they were not showing up. A lot of people were not working anymore. That's why I said, do you realize it's all handmade? Do you mm -hmm. complain to your mom today's dish she made is not perfectly well? You just eat it because she made it with passion. That's how I look at those people when they're creating, when they're rolling each and every single cigar. And, and there is nothing but passion going through that. You know, she knows, or he knows, most, most of them, the ladies also working. You look at them like, wow, who am I to do her job? You know, she's been doing this for ages now. Since she all, all she knows is doing this cigar, all he knows is doing this. And, and to bring food to their family every night relies on their hard work and, again, passion. It's no, the it job, you know, every day they work almost... 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And doing yeah. that consistently, like yeah. you just, when you see a bunch of cigars, like at the same time, like walking into a humidor, like in, in a store, it's just insane. Like they're all handmade, like in the consistency, like to get it right every time. Yeah. I, I don't think I could replicate that skill either. No. And, and, and you just don't want to do it. It's, it's <laughs> enjoy it. You know, to each its own thing in life. You know, you don't want to go to the to Bordeaux and just walk in the vineyard and say, "Oh, I'm going to create my own wine now. Give me some grapes here." No, it doesn't work like that. It's, well, it's like eating your own food that you made. Like it just tastes so much better when someone else does it. <laughs> That's for the cooking. In that term, I'm not a modest person. I'm the best cook. Oh my god! <laughs> I envy you. I could throw stuff together with me, be, but I don't. I don't know if it's immaculate. I would love to cook for everybody. I'm a big mama cooking kind of a person. I, I'm. I'm, a, I'm. I love cooking. So in, when I'm when I'm cooking, I don't want anybody to be around me. Even <laughs> thing, he goes. He likes to help me, and I just look at him. I'm so aggressive in the kitchen. It's all, I'm a German shepherd in the kitchen. It's my territory. I. I, I <laughs> You know, just don't, no, no. Everything. You're ruining it. You're ruining it. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. You know, it's just you know, that's exactly how I see when people are in the industry, in the factory, they're rolling the cigar. You don't want to touch that beauty. <laughs> it's her work. It's her beautiful work. No, absolutely. I, I I'm an okay cook. My wife is a great cook. I more tend to the smoked meats side of cooking. Cause I could sit outside with a bourbon and you know, it's like at least four to 10 hours minimum. And that's a several cigar. So I always am like, yeah, I got to sit outside and watch the meat cook and smoke and have a few drinks. So that that's, that's where I actually make my own bacon. Um, that I'm yeah, really, really proud of. I, I do. I do. I heard amazing believe. things about your bacon. Yes. Uh, yes. It's, it's, I have said nothing amazing about it. It's everybody else that has been so kind to support uh, that and get it from me. Uh, so if anyone's interested, please reach out. Uh, I've got a list I could throw you on. But I do, I, I make my own maple uh, brown sugar thyme bacon. Oh, and it is, it is just, oh, sorry. I'm I just thinking about it. It just makes me hungry. Um, so one of the things that I, I don't, I, a lot of people talk about it, but I don't think a lot of the, like, outside of, like, the hardcore cigar, quote-unquote, geeks, like, at least the three of us here and most of the people watching the show, don't really understand cigars is not a man's world. It true, It's Hollywood that made cigars a man's world. It's Hollywood that made the gangster or, you know, or the bad guy in the movie smoke a cigar. But in reality, three quarters of a factory is women outside of the fields. And that may be some work in the fields as well. No, but the a lot vast of 
and work in the field. A lot. Really? So that, I was told that was mainly the guys that did the field. The women did the sorting, the, the de-stemming, the rolling, the, you know, more of the um, fine work involved in a cigar. So there are there's a lot of women in the fields too. Absolutely, yep. Okay, and I don't think a lot of people know that. It's a quite a balanced uh, ratio between men and women, but in the factory, yes, the majority you can see there. It, I mean, it, it creates a perfect environment for them to work and to take care of their families, you know. And uh, usually, it's a uh, matriarchal kind of uh, family the grandma is taking care of the children the daughters are in the factories rolling it's a decent life uh, and, and and whoever works in the factory they know they have a decent job we're talking about countries where finding jobs uh, a decent job is not an easy task uh, it is a lot of hard work also you're, you're leaving your child just behind all day and your mom is taking care of that the family of, of, of the whole family and, and they're doing it because they want to give a decent life to their children. It's the dream of that lady who is willing, and they love to have children and they love families. They are very family oriented. And you see it like she doesn't think of how much food I can, I can provide if I work less or more. She thinks about making bigger family and, and take care of that family even if she has to work extra hours or work more just because she loves what she created for herself. Absolutely. So when you first got into this, did you know or were you kind of taken aback by how much of the actual production, the rolling, the field? Thank you for opening up my eyes on. I'm sorry. I put a hat on to stop washing my my shiny little dome out. But the white hat is causing a lot more glare than I want. So I think that'll, there you go. Now my face is not as washed out. Sorry, my camera is just driving me nuts. But anyways, um, so was that a bit of a kind of a eye-opening experience to you? Or did you know the whole time that a lot of women worked in the snow? No, uh, Fuad told me pretty much about, when I went to Cuba in, the, in 97, I saw, but it was like more like a touristic visit rather than a business or, or more like involved in the business. But you saw the number of women over there working in the industry. But when I first went to the Dominican and I saw it live, in real life, I could see the, the magnitude of it. And I, I, was, I was kind of astonished. I was surprised and I was pleasantly surprised. And, and, and you know, you look at them and you see like at the end of the day, it's just a different location, a different location in this entire globe. But every woman wants to achieve something. And it's not anymore, like you said, a gangster kind of thing. People enjoy the cigar from the rich, from the poor, from every everywhere. It's just a ritual they like. Whoever is making the cigar is making other people happy. And she knows, they know, they know what they're doing with their hard work. And it is a pleasant surprise to me. And I would do everything to empower them to help if i can do way more even to create a certain uh a global movement a lot of people are doing it some of them maybe you i mean amanda is part of anastasia it. Uh, anastasia yeah yeah she's she's a hard working lady who also comes from an academic uh she's a she has a phd she was a, a lecturing doctor a doctor in, in in athens and now she's following her passion and doing uh she left everything behind her, and she's involved with the cigar uh, as 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 to create a a, a, a smoother uh, ground for for women who had some you know some they were a little shy or a little reluctant in smoking uh, openly and. You know, even in London, people used to look at me like, "Oh, woman smoking cigar." I had a lot of people approaching me like. Oh, you smoke a cigar? And you're, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, right <laughs> it's funny, right? In the ancient times where, especially in some societies where women are definitely not good, well seen smoking a cigar, that same society, may I say, maybe in the Arab world or in the Middle East, let's say, they used to smoke shisha. And look at those old history books where a lot of women talking about societies where women 
definitely are oppressed. We cannot deny that. We still have a lot of societies where women totally oppressed under under severe oppression from family, from uh, government, society. Let's not talk politics. You're not going to like that. <laughs> I can go on forever. But in those same countries, look at their history books. Women were there were like drawings or paintings or, or pictures of women smoking shisha or the hookah or mm-hmm. uh, anything that smoked tobacco. They used to smoke tobacco. Now it yeah. was not in a cigar uh, feature, but it was smoking. Even even they used to in, in, in Afghanistan, I think women used to smoke opium in those yep. pipes. Mm-hmm. You, know, yep. Yep. you have a lot of uh, old, very old pictures or old drawings of those women. I'm sure it's not just an imagination of the painter. It was a reality. You can't sure, imagine. Sure, sure. So when you first started really going to lounges, walk us through an experience that was like just where somebody was just kind of like, oh my gosh, it's a woman smoking cigars. And you kind of had to set them straight. Like, what was what was that like? And then kind of when you walk into a lounge now versus back then, what is that like now? In the United States, um, and I'm proud to be now uh, a legal alien of the United States, a legal <laughs> alien of the United States. Uh, I've never encountered such a uh, bad experience. Good. I- it was my personality nobody ever you know this is the most pleasant thing to say i've never encountered anything that i had to be a little aggressive or mean i can be mean very mean. Can- <laughs> well you were saying you're a thug and i i, I wouldn't want to cross you definitely yeah that's why i wanted to ask that, that question no, I mean, I just, like, I, you, like, I, elbowed I mean, someone or headlock yeah, or- cracking some shins <laughs> yeah, yeah well know. listen being a thug sometimes it's just you know, I've worked in a very much a world. Financial world is a merciless, ruthless. Mm-hmm. It, it, people are mean, especially when people think, "Oh, women are jealous of each other." It's true, but that's human nature. Humans are jealous. That's it's. It's not just envious, uh, jealousy. And in in my world, when when I used to to work on certain projects and having to, uh, ha- I've encountered a lot of aggressive approach from male colleagues than from female colleagues so let's put it that way so i really came from the background where i really had to fight my way out you know being blonde and not looking too masculine so uh, i I, i'm a tomboy in 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 the head so i wouldn't say tomboy i'm just a woman who had that passion for work whenever i was working in the finance and then when i started moving to the cigar world one incident maybe it's going to be funny or maybe it's a gross i was in london in a speakeasy lounge, it was at the Chiltern Firehouse, a very famous, nice place in London. And uh, there is a, a mirror in the bathroom. You just push the mirror for whoever. No, it's a speakeasy. You push it, and you're outside in a little, little garden alley thing where people go and smoke. And I was there. My friends were with me. They don't smoke cigars. So I just went down to have a puff, or smoke my cigar. And this guy comes to me. Who, he didn't know what he was, what was coming. He said, "Oh, that's a, that's a big stick in your mouth." I said, no. "Oh, oh, oh, I've heard that one." <laughs> I, yeah, and I look at him. I go, "Like, uh, it depends on, you know, your measure of what's big is for you." <laughs> I, I don't think he ever went to that speakeasy place ever in his life. Yeah, real and life you- comparison, not that impressive. Yes, it, it depends on how you see the sticks. <laughs> You have. So, yeah, that's that's not good for a woman. That's not ladylike, especially not in London. But he didn't know what to say, and he disappeared. That's a good thing. And never in the United States, honestly, never. I, I, I've, I've all, always had the most macho-looking, big, tattooed guy with the most pleasant personality. They love to know more about the cigar. They love to know... Uh, they never see us as female and male. When you're smoking no. cigars, we're just equally People. enjoying it. Yeah. I, I mean, really, I've never had, honestly, I've never had that that ever as well, a issue or ever. On that, the makes, that makes me really proud of our country yeah, that uh, it never I, gave you that. I and that very much. We, and we've been to, if I'm going to say a thousand, maybe too much, but hundreds of events where from 
cyclists, motorcyclists from people were like, oh, you're going to this event. And even our sales rep, our sales rep, Jennifer Nicole. She's yes, I've met her. Famous. Mm -hmm. She goes by herself to those big Texan motorcyclist event or the, uh, like, how, how many cyclists are there? Like 15,000. 15,000. Not, not all Harley Davidson, are they? No, no. Some of them, they're just a group of, you know, bikers. And those bikers are there. She never came saying one day to us or, you know, we're friends and we talk a lot. And she never had an issue, ever. And Jennifer is one of the beautiful ladies. She doesn't hide her beauty. She she just She's just herself. Not that because she's at the bikers event, she's going with the turtleneck and the, and the, uh, uh, you know, and the big jacket on her. Just the way she is. I never encountered that. That means we are way more advanced in the United States uh, in that in, in that fashion. Yeah. Absolutely. And if anybody is ever thinking about what the perception of women are thinking when they're smoking a cigar, little plug for Lauren here. Go watch her new little uh, her new little video. Uh, and it will certainly make you giggle. Won't tell you what it is. Go search it out. Uh, it's quite entertaining. And the look on her face at the end is like, really? Really? Uh, so definitely go check out uh, the McAuliffe shorts that Lauren does. They're always, they're always funny and entertaining. I got to ask, what is that big... Now, that's your band, correct, from the cigar that you have. What is this? On the other hand, yeah. Oh wow, that looks like a just like a wrecker if you nailed someone with it. <laughs> it, it uh, you know, uh, it's funny. Even when we're sitting in this corner in the house, for some reason, I, I you know, I always uh, relate our life to our childhood. If you look at any baby, the first thing he's astonished and amazed to discover is his hands, those little hands, you know. And and I think it just went with me all the way until now. I'm 52 year old young baby, and I'm always, you know, when I'm smoking cigars, I always put the band. At some point, I put the band as a ring, and I just enjoy it even alone. Me, and my husband sitting here, nothing, nobody's here to see it, but just enjoy wearing a ring and enjoying my cigar with that ring. It's fascinating to me. Oh, that, that's a very nice looking ring uh, that you have. And it's a beautiful looking band ring uh, that you have as well. Thank you. Thank now, I want to kind of dig into a little something. And it's a segment I do with literally every guest because it's a segment that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm 37 years old. Uh, I know I look significantly older. You don't have to say no. Uh, but so I'm 37 years old. But I will tell you that I have people in my life that are the only reason why I'm here today. And I'm not even talking about family or my wife. That's my drive. I'm talking about people that supported me, that told me news that I didn't want to hear, that I avoided phone calls because I knew they were going to say what I didn't want to hear but needed to hear. And those are my mentors. And, and fortunately, uh, Dan Thompson of McAuliffe is is somebody I'm very proud uh, to call a mentor of mine. Actually refused me to be a partner the first time I ever met him, even though he had watched the show and I worked my ass off and then finally approached him and he's like, now you're ready. That was one of the highlights of my life to have somebody that meant that much to me deny me to then just turn around, deny me to build me, not deny me to break me down. But he knew my mentality was, you tell me no, all I'm going to do is build that and build that and build that. So I want to ask you, as somebody that's been through multiple careers, multiple countries, and has now ended into the cigar world, what is your idea and concept of, being, of having a mentor or having a mentee underneath you? Well, I've, I've always loved reading and uh, I come from a different culture where I had to learn different languages uh, from very young age. I went to a French school and my first reading that really made a big difference in my, in my uh, perception of life was Victor Hugo. 
And uh, one of his quotes was, is, to love is to act. And I've always followed that motto in my life. Indeed, to love is one thing, but just loving and stopping where you love that thing is never enough. It's, you need to act as little as that, as that act can be. Uh, and all my life I followed that. And a lot of quotes in my life, uh, one of them is an Australian author also, is I think Justin Harold. He said, winners make things happen, losers let things happen. And I yes. do follow that to heart, yes. like deep inside my heart. I always put that in mind whenever I'm feeling a little down, a little low. I go like, now, recently, of course, I have to admit that looking at Fuad's career and one day hopefully he will be on the show and I will be just every day I listen to him how he made it as a student to the United States and the minute he arrived to the United States his father lost his business literally after one day he went to the United States as a student and uh, he was supposed to, to to do his master's degree in, in in the US and go to California. He landed in New Jersey. The person who was supposed to pick him up at the airport never showed up. No language, no phone. He spoke English, but no, no phone, nothing back then. He stayed at the airport over 10 hours until somebody showed up to pick him up. And his father called the day after. He said, I lost my business. You either come back or you make it happen. And he started working as a gas. No, he was before working at the gas station attendant. He worked in, in cleaning toilets from a student from the American University of Beirut, from a kind of a comfortable family. He started cleaning the bathrooms in gas stations. You know how, what does, what, what yeah. does that? And I just, I thought always, you know, a girl looks at her father's career. You look at your mom, you see all these things. You think of yourself as your own mentor. Everybody thinks they have their own inner mentor also. There's always a voice in your head that's pushing you either down or up. Mm -hmm. and now I would say I have three people in my life. One of them is Fuad and my two children. I have a 32-year-old and a 30-year-old son, two boys. And I see myself in them. You know, even Fuad tells me that, wow, like, look at that connection. Because I gave so much to my children everything in politics in life in in ethics in culture and now i take all that energy from them and uh, if i'm doing anything that i might feel like they would disagree that would be the only voice that would tell me don't do it don't do it yeah. yes i would I, I have to say like apart from those big authors or big philosophers that i i've always read and wanted to to do something little from their philosophy because who are we those philosophers change the world today my mentor is Fuad, and every time i look at him every day i look at him every morning i look at him with admiration and and go like i would have never been able to achieve what he has done today Fuad is a successful businessman mm. and the least pretentious person i've ever ever encountered or met in my life that's that's amazing. And at the end of this show, I actually, when I was on uh, one of your Instagram lives, I actually had asked, hey, would you come on my show? And he said, absolutely, without even knowing who the hell I was. I mean, I was so you can ask him now. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, at the end of this show, Don't we're going to spot or anything. Yeah, <laughs> at the end of this show, we're going to book you. Uh, we'll open the calendar because I want you on as well. I want to have your background on here as well. I'll be sitting um, there. He'll be sitting on this chair. So, surprisingly, then, surprisingly, I did not know that you're the one who's doing the show with her. And I <laughs> yesterday or the day before when I just logged into your Instagram, and I really did not know until I saw you this, uh, right now. I said, oh, shit. I just uh, logged into his Instagram show. and uh, uh, it was, uh, just. Uh, did you know you were my mentor? No. But, uh, <laughs> yes, I, you I, did. I, I thank Aww. you for so you make a really good point there right now, what you just did. Mentor to me, I've never walked up to somebody and be like, now you're my mentor. It kind of naturally <laughs> evolves. It naturally happens. And it has to. Because both parties, the only way a mentor is worthwhile is if the mentor is selfless and cares about your success and doesn't want anything from it. 
And if you have that natural, exactly, you have that natural, like, will you be this? Then it's always kind of like, well, what are you going to do for me? So when it's that natural, that's really what solidifies it. But you made another really good point that I honestly never thought about. You don't ever have to know your mentor. You had mentioned authors. These are authors that probably you've never met. Authors in themselves could be a mentor if you study them, you read them, you live by what they say. And that's actually never been a concept that I've, I've personally thought about. But come to think of it, there are a lot of authors that I have read where I'm like, yeah, I don't have that personal relationship, but damn, you've given me a lot of advice that I just can't turn away. And so that's a really good point. And you made another good one about age has nothing to do with who can be a mentor to who you can learn from somebody that's younger than you. As long as your mind is open to that, you could have a younger person as a mentor and you as your, as the mom can still be a mentor to your kids. It can be a two way street, Absolutely. you know, and I don't think a lot of people look at a mentorship like that, but it yeah, has really to unique. be too. Yeah, right, Lauren? Because it does have Very to be unique. a two-way street to an extent. Um, you know, and you had also you had said that quote about the Australian thing. And one of the things that you know I've called Dan, and and Dan's just one of uh of many for me. And one of the things he goes, Okay, fine, are you done? Now start giving me solutions. And that's kind of literally what you said is the successful, what, what was the quote again? Winners make things happen, losers make, let things happen. Correct. And the winners make things happen because they bitch and moan and then that's it. And then it's solutions. How do I get through this? The losers wallow in themselves. They fall down. Woe is me. And they stick there. That's true. So has there ever been a time where you felt like stuck that you had then maybe flowed or your kids come in and go, no, you're not. And actually go, listen, this is not where you need to be. This is not who you are. Come back. Have you ever had that experience? Uh, at, at that time, uh, when I was 14, my mom had a stroke. She was 39. And uh, that was a big uh, how can I say, a virtual mentor in that in that case I was looking at myself as a 14 year old adolescent teenager and I had only one sister at that time in the worst time of year of war in Lebanon this was the nastiest war we were literally hiding for days in the underground not knowing what's what what day we are what what life looks outside those hideaways when my mom got in that stroke and she went to the hospital walking and you know, everything was great and then she came out of the hospital two months later after a coma and she was completely paralyzed she lost her speech and she lived like that she was vegging for six for 22 years she, she wow. and that was every day lesson of my life like when she lost all her friends because you realize like people you know, you have number of people shrinking or, or diminishing in your life because they don't see you anymore with any value in your life. Maybe life is taking them towards their occupations, their lives, but somebody who is vegging is not really a big entertaining person in your life. And those few people were coming to visit her or call her, even though she couldn't speak, they used to call her and she was just listening. Those are also my mentors. In that term i would say the self actualization is the best thing we can do to evolve every day i meet ladies and men of course and and look at their their passion i always listen i love to listen to their career to their life how they shifted from one career to another every person the first person i worked for was a, was a gentleman and he was a mentor to me. He taught me so much about life. He taught me, he believed in me. And that's why I was looking and he was an old Jewish lawyer. He gave me so much of, of this whole uh, industry and not just like, uh, not the cigar, right? Of course, it was the business world. And he was believing in me as a young kid. He kind of, I was the protege, you know, he's teaching me stuff about 
life. The first time I had to work for him, he said, uh, I want you to go to the HR department. I was a kid. I was like, you know, I'm doing my, my first steps in the, in the world of business. And he said, when you get the, the CV of a person, you just bring it. You don't read it. You just put it in front of you so you don't forget the name of the person you're interviewing. And I was like, are you serious? I'm just like, like a kid looking at him. What are you talking about? He said, you know how many of these people, they had to have that degree because of their parents. Him being Jewish and me being Armenian, we know what our parents do. Oh, yeah. Become a doctor. You need to become a lawyer. You need to become nope. something. He said most of them, they didn't want to be that. So when the passion is not there, he will never be able to give you what you're expecting from him. Interview the person to see his passion, to discover his passion for the job he is asking to do. And that was one of another one of the big lessons in my life. Like, forget about what people have in their background, what they studied, what they work, where they did. Let let them talk about themselves, how passionate they are, how real they are, how how genuine they are. And Again, I have to remember Mr. Sipsa. It was a long, long time ago. I was, I was 19, 20, and, and that is a lesson also. When somebody believed in you and taught you, and up until now, when I meet people, I don't care about their social status. I don't care about what their job is, what they did. It's, am I going to connect with this person? On what level am I connecting with this person? Am I keeping this person in my life or not? You know, we can have acquaintances, but then you have people, you know, that the minute you meet that person, that person is in your life. He's there. Yeah. 110% agree with that. It's one of the reasons why I do zero research for this show. The reason why I do zero research for this show is because I don't want to be stuck in my notes to where I'm like, I'm going to ask this next. I'm going to ask this. I'd rather just live in the conversation and see where the conversation evolves. I don't have a stack of papers in front of me or nothing. And, and that was something I also was taught when I used to do insurance it was almost the same thing. Just keep the, just keep their profile in front of you. So that way, you know who you're talking to and you can go down and reference it in case you forget, but don't get stuck in the profile because then you lose the person in front of you based on the stats that are in paper. And like you said, maybe they didn't want to have those stats on paper. Maybe they were forced to from family. So it's always best to just get to know them. And that's the approach I take on this is just like, I've had people come in like, Oh, did you ever, did you research my background? Like, no. So what do you know about me? Nothing. We're going to find out. We go live right now. I'm going to put you in the background, you know, and like, and like that's, but that's fun for me because it makes the conversation more real, less scripted. It makes the connection more real. And it ends up being, in my opinion, usually a, a better interview because I'm more focused on what you're saying than I am on the questions that I should be asking, you know? And so I appreciate it. you're fantastic. I this is awesome. Uh, you're like the your background is incredibly inspirational. You chased your husband, he chased you first, you chased him back. You had <laughs> so <laughs> that is fantastic. He's a, you look at him as a mentor, your kids. I've never had somebody say my kids, my yeah. kids, but that just goes to show that you did a fucking amazing job raising them that you're now looking to them and going, I actually value your opinion. Yes, I'm your mom, but I value your opinion equally. And, and that is, that is amazing. Uh, and that is a fantastic lookout for or a, a fantastic look on life and family. Um, I will have to ask you though, do you think a mentor is somebody that needs to be able to at all times be that contradictory voice in your head that gives you not the yes men approach, but that person that goes, I don't think you should do that. Here's why versus somebody that goes every single time. Yeah, you should do it. Yeah, you should do it. Yeah, you should do it. 
you know i i'm not looking exactly that's the reason why i told about my kids i told you like my kids are my mentors as well because this is the only real thing there is no filter between you and your children it's always the raw the real thing your son your daughter will never tell you something you want to hear he's going to be abruptly telling you what's right and what's wrong because he knows you love him with zero condition unconditionally and i, I mean i say that to every parent when you give your children that security pass that i'm gonna love you regardless i love you there is no reason at all why we will ever stop loving you and that's when your child will be able to just abruptly tell you that what you're doing i disagree with it might i might not like it at the moment but come and think of it who better than your own self you know your little gene a better gene of you of course and like a, 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 a updated version of your software 2.0 yeah <laughs> you're updating yourself actualizing yourself you're updating yourself with that thing that new version of your ios and he's just giving you the best part of you and showing you what's best and what's not best for you and so far i am i'm blessed and i'm very lucky that i really found myself in in those three men i, I live in a men's world two boys fuad has two daughters also and uh one of them is a lawyer. The other one is still in university. And I I do have to say that it was one of the biggest success of our relationship that I they look at me uh, as as their mentor. And that's I take pride in that. I'm very proud of myself. If I say, if you tell me what are you proud of, that's one of the biggest pride I take. I'm very proud of that. Any moment anybody can call me and I'm I'm the mother for them. I'm the stepmom for uh, for us daughter, and I'm mostly there. Everything, the friend, the one who will be sometimes rough, being broke and thug, and I will tell them things the way I, not the way they want to hear it, but the way I see it. And none of them so far ever said to me, "Oh, that's mean," or because I'm never mean. You're never mean with your own blood and with your own chosen family. You can't be mean. You just be real. And in the back, at the end of the day, if you, they think of it, I mean, why would I say something that would hurt them, right? And the same thing, it, it's it's vice versa. Why would the kids tell me anything that is bad for me? On the contrary, they want the best for me and as much as I want the best for them. So you, you said something there, and I want to kind of stretch it out a little bit. So before I get into the lightning round questions to end the show, you said something where essentially you were talking about criticism. Define criticism and define constructual versus non-constructual. Interesting. Yes. I would say like when you criticize someone, just being sarcastically criticizing, that's what we do in everyday life. We became, especially with the social media now, everybody has his own opinion. They criticize your work, they criticize your life, they criticize your lifestyle, whether it's a good or a bad or whatever you're doing is every day, uh, it self-actualizes you because you see that people don't know. They see something and they're, they're all having their own opinion regardless of what they know, what's the real thing in front of them. With, with, your, with your direct mentors, who happen to be my children in this case, and, and Fuad, when I discuss something that is critical or very crucial for the decision, if the majority of those two or three people are agreeing or disagreeing, that's the real criticism that will make me evolve and make it the correct, the right way. I might do some alteration in the decision or some changes but there will be definitely a beneficial i believe in team i believe in uh, we were discussing yesterday about a certain person that to hire or not to hire i gave my opinion about that person impulsive uh, approach or to things and at the same time very professional person and fuad's approach was the criticism that he was making about my way of thinking made me think of it a lot later on about how i was wrong or right 
and I think I was wrong because we can always, we can never find the perfect person. Instead, it's always you either choose the professional or the personality, and you can never have an employee or someone you work with who has it all, who has everything perfectly well. I'm quite a perfectionist. Sometimes I like everything to be like done yesterday, done perfectly well. <laughs> yes, I do that, and it's one of my biggest uh, uh, negative point you might say I, I i push myself hard and again because he discussed it with me in a, such an um, elevated way or such an uh, noble way i i do i did believe in his and i texted the person even and i said let's i, I want to talk to you next week and uh, have a uh, meeting with you so yeah that's a simple daily thing that can happen and uh, a positive Criticism can also make you think that it's never really negative, really. What he said was something very positive at the end of the day, and I changed my mind. No, you're 100% correct. I've been, like I said, when it, when we first started talking about mentors, I literally have had mentors that I've denied their phone call for a week. Not because I was going like, they're going to give me bad advice, is because I knew they were going to tell me something I didn't want to hear. Yeah. But again, though, there are there is a difference between positive criticism to build up and criticism to tear down. I knew the criticism that I needed to, because I've been in sales 20 years. I've had a lot of help, uh, a lot of training, a lot of great advice. I don't always want to hear it sometimes because in my younger years, I knew better. And, and so it took me a lot of growth to be able to understand, which is why I asked you to define it because I think people look at criticism as a constant negative because you're telling me I'm doing something wrong. But in reality, criticism where they explain to you what you're doing wrong or maybe thinking of something wrong and then they turn around and go, think of it this way. We might not always want to hear it, but if it's done with love and if it's done in a good intent, it's not always the easiest to hear. But in the end, you come to the understanding of, I, I needed to hear that. As much as I didn't want to, I needed to hear it. Listen, we have an ego. We cannot deny it. We cannot deny that our ego comes before any position. And I'm not sure which general said it, but they said never put your ego next to your uh, position because when your position falls, your ego will fall or the other way around. I can't. Oh, remember. I love that. That's a great quote. Yeah. I love that. I think it was Colin Powell. I'm not sure. It was some time ago. Uh, and uh, discussing, like you said, something that you don't want to hear at the end, you're the beneficiary of that. Thing that you didn't want to hear because even if you're not ready but you you at least you heard it some way where maybe when you're driving maybe when you're eating it's gonna pop up like bubble and and you will think of it and definitely it will make a different change a small change maybe or a big change but that's a way of it as long as you're open to it you're ready for it you're not always ready to hear something that you don't want to hear mm -hmm. but you listen to it once it might pop up maybe five years later, but that's going to come back to you. Oh yeah, and and when I would, I used to do door to door insurance. Okay, back oh, in my, God, my <laughs> yo, it's the boot camp of sales, Oof. and uh, I did very very well. But one of the things that my mentor knew when I or my boss knew when I was ducking him, I just wouldn't pick up the phone, and he would text me, "Stop it! You need to hear what I need to say." I love you. We're going to work through this together. I'm here to build you up. And any single time I didn't answer the phone, that was the text. I'm here to build you up. I'm not here to tear you down. And it is something that a lot of people need to understand is that somebody good in your life will give you all the stuff and flash it in front of you that you need to work on. But then they will also give you a door to walk through and an ability to work on that. And they will work with you. And that was always the scariest thing to me when I first started bringing people into my life and trusting them 
that they had my best interest in mind versus just myself was that I didn't want to hear what you had to say. But then when I did, they positioned it in a way where I was like, my life would be worse if I didn't listen to you right now. Okay. And, and that's something to me that I've always cherished with people in my life that I confide in is I don't always want to listen to them because sometimes the truth hurts. And sometimes you need that person that gives you that quote unquote awful truth. So that way you're, you're listening and then they build you up. You build your immunity, Ryan. That's how you immune to become by having those little viruses and those little microbes in your life. Maybe you think it's a virus. Maybe you think it's something wrong, but that's how you build it. You build your immunity to life, to, to every other obstacle in your life, every other disease in your life, illness in your life, mental, work, life, everything can bring you down in a second. Everything disappear. The best example I gave you when my mom got sick, it was a lesson of life. I said, my mom was so devoted to a 39 year old and then she wasn't definitely expecting to come out. And, and the worst thing that happened to her after she left the hospital, everything was not functioning except her wisdom and that wasn't easy for her because she couldn't believe we could read it every day. And I used to say, would she be able to to decide about this life? She would have said, "No, I don't want to do it. I didn't want. I, I didn't want to be in this body, in this soul, alive in this body." But that's a lesson. That's how you read people's mind. They give you a little scar here and there, but that will always remind you of, you know, not to do the wrong thing because. Somewhere there is a tiny little scar, and it's beautiful. Those little scars are beautiful. So you mentioned little scars, and before I get into the lightning, I just think, I think you and I are simpatico on this. I have one regret in my life: smoking cigarettes. I smoked for twenty years, and people look at me and go, "Dude, this, this, and this, and this has happened in your life, but you're doing. Do you regret that?" And I look at them and I used to say yes. And then in talking with somebody, they were like, do you really regret X, Y, and Z? Because X, Y, and Z brought you here. Because if X, Y, and Z was different, you would be somewhere different. Do you like your life? I had a terrible, I got a DUI. I don't care if anybody knows this. 13, 15 years ago, my DUI made me work at a grocery store because I couldn't drive. I met my wife at the grocery store. Okay. Now we're married with a daughter. So if I turn around and say, I regret my DUI, that's me mentally saying, I regret meeting my wife. That's and, right. and, and mm -hmm. so many people have taught me find the feather of good and you will fly past the bad. And that is something that, do you take that approach? Do you have any regrets to where you wished it didn't happen because you wouldn't be who you are? I, I always say that no regrets in everything, everything I have done in my life, the good, the bad, the ugly things, everything made me who I am today. And I would, if I go back in time, I would definitely do everything the same way I did. If I had to listen to more people or tell more people that I love them, I wouldn't regret. I, I always express my love to people now because I know life is too short, really short. Some people need to hear it. Some people need, need that little five extra minutes of time that you're busy. And, and uh, what it always tells me, uh, I wish you could listen to yourself when you're talking to people, encouraging them through hard times, through difficult times, and do it to yourself. But that's what I tell him. It's like the doctor always is the last person who will heal himself and the first thing we'll do is talking to people and taking care of them and and i'm i do take pride in that i love to listen to people and i know that every one extra minute of your time on the phone or sending a card or just calling someone in times of uh, in, in difficult times you know the person is devastated it's going to be a negative conversation but i hear it a lot oh i don't want to hear this negative person in my life no we need to we, we need to support each other in every aspect. We've been through a lot. Some people were there for us. And life is a cycle. You know, today is my turn to listen to other people. And there will be times where I will have, I will, I'll be seeking 
help and I'll be looking for someone who is there to, to listen to me, even for a few minutes and make me, you know, give me some comfort there. Oh, we're, not we're, we're, we're kindred spirits. I, 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 I love you. And this has been fantastic. So let me jump into some lightning rounds to wrap up the show. All right. So these are just real quick answers. Uh, and these are just kind of to give people a little insight into what you enjoy. So what is your favorite rapper? Now, I've had people give me musician and cigar rapper or just cigar <laughs> rapper. It's completely up to you. But what is your favorite rapper? And then part two to that, what is a rapper that you would like to work with that you haven't yet? Yes. Um, I love Corojo. It's the one you're smoking right now there, over there. And the, the next rapper that I've always, I've been working two years, exactly two years now, uh, for the Cameroon rapper. Mm. And only last week, after more than 20 different blends, totally different blends, to come up with the perfect Cameroon that will will give me that X factor the, of, of satisfaction, like no number, like no way of describing how happy I was, was happened last week, just like that. It took less than half an hour, it, less than half an hour, it was just there. You know, two years after two years of work, and that was I love Cameroon. I, I like the full body, full flavor uh, cigar, full body, and mostly full strength. And that every time I smoke it, I still next time I will miss it again. You know, when I'm finishing my my first my first cigar, and and I want I look forward for oh tomorrow I'm going to smoke the same Cameroon again, and I'm I'm so excited about having it soon. It's now getting. Uh, it's in the factory it's in the process of getting ready and uh, i can't wait for it in terms of cigars that's one of the things yes all right everybody so be on the lookout for a cameroon wrapper from highland mm -hmm. solomon this mm -hmm. is absolutely fantastic i love the cameroon so i'm looking very forward to that uh what is your favorite size cigar um i i pretty much like robusto and toro right oh yeah i i'm i'm very much and i like the Straight cut robusto. I don't know why. Recently, I'm much into robusto, but a toro. But then again, if it's a full body, I like a, a, a little bigger gauge. Sometimes I, if I'm gonna have like a full strength cigar, full not just full body, a full strength that goes right on, you know, with the full nicotine, which is the case of the the broadleaf Pennsylvania broadleaf. It has you know very big, intense, harsh. Flavor. I like a bigger gauge in that. It depends. Uh, we have the Bale Prophet. I like it in a bigger gauge. The Bale Prophet. Although we have the Lancero. I love Lanceros. Again, it's like asking about your children, which is your favorite. It depends, I, you know? I love Lanceros. Yeah. I'm I'm that person that's like, make a Lancero. I have boxes in my cubicle. I love Lanceros. So you had said straight cut Robusto. So I assume straight cut's your favorite cut. It is. Okay. What is your favorite Perry? It could be as simple as a as a Perrier or Pellegrino as and and it can go to I love cognac. I love bourbon. But I'm uh, I mean I'm loving bourbon because of Fuad. I was not a big bourbon person until I, I moved to the United States and uh, discovering the bourbon world is quite intriguing, quite exciting. Uh, love wine, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I love a full body wine. I think you were drinking a Syrah, you said. And oh, I, Lauren? Lauren, what were you drinking? There? Oh, like, drinking Shiraz. Oh, Shiraz, yeah. I yeah. Love Shiraz. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I like good Italian wine. I like good French wine. Uh, a Pomerol, uh, full body that the tannin will literally attack my, my palate. And then you come to discover the best of that that wine and the cigar merging. Coffee is also a big thing in my life. I love a good espresso that is like short, give me a punch and then that the cigar is coming. To clean my palate, I like to eat a lime. It kind of turns my, my palate very alkaline and, and I know that I'm trying a new cigar. Uh, I'm, I, I don't enjoy cleaning my palate with a with coffee unlike most people i love lime 
I like to have a big chunk of blood. Husband is listening to the conversation. <laughs> so, I know one of the tenets of Masonic is you have to believe in a creator. Doesn't matter what the creator is, you got to believe in a creator. So, yeah. I wanted to ask you this question. When the time comes, what would you like the creator that you believe in to say to you? When the time comes, I just want to feel like I've I've used the best of my life the way the creator expected me to do so, believing that life is short, there is one time. We don't know what's going to happen after life. We don't know what happened before life. We know that we have these years to fulfill, to complete. Very mathematic mind that I have. I like to use every single day of my life. Lauren said, do you ever sleep? I sleep like a baby. <laughs> I, when I sleep, I sleep like a baby, but that's it. When I sleep, when I wake up, it's like the diesel engine. Okay. I, I'm on until I sleep again. So I, I love to sleep with a smile. I love to say thank God for this day and looking forward to wake up next morning. And, and trying to fill the day with the best I can do. The minute I'm going to die, I just want to say, is there anything I need to do? Not really, but yeah, I'm not ready to go. No, I'm not. When that time does happen, how do you want the cigar community to remember you? I want them to be proud of this, the fact that, you know, the love that we have for the cigar, the passion we have for the cigar. I want people to believe that, oh, there was, oh, Romy was not from the family of the, you know, the big families of cigar making industry. And what we're doing today, the hard work we're doing today, all I want to just make them remember sometimes with a smile, like there was a lady who really believed in her husband, in his work, in his passion for for, for the masons, for the cigars, and continued that legacy. A tiny little legacy, not even one letter of the legacy word, maybe L. Up until I reached the Y, that would be a great thing. People remembering me with the positive uh, value that I can add to whoever, listen to them, share the cigar with them. Oh, uh, yeah, I know her. I remember her. We had a good chat. You know, I don't want them to remember me with she's mean or oh, that person was... Uh, a show-off person or was a, uh, I don't know, was a snobbish person. No, I just want to remember those chats we have. Those precious chats, you know, that's how I remember. I meet so many people in, in the world of cigar. We meet people every single day. And some people just remind me, they go like, oh, I know you don't remember me, but we smoked this. I go like, yeah, I remember we had this conversation, you know. And a lot of ladies, one of them, Ana Ramirez, I think, she's doing her own cigars. And uh, she's a lady from Dominican. And she was devastated for some reason. Things went bad in the business. And she was hoping to have the cigars. And we had a little chat. She was like, oh, my God, that really encouraged me. I want to go on. I want to pursue it. I want to do it. And I said, yeah, don't let, don't, don't let anything bring you down. Just move, move forward. We're here to help. You need anything, call me. You need anything, call Amanda, call Leo. Leo is an amazing example. Leo, of course, of Nova Cigar. She's an amazing example. Love Leo. Love her. Yeah, she was on last time. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Anastasia, all these people, I'm talking about the ladies here, but also a lot of men, like the Fuente family, all the charity they do, all the great job they do, the, the, the female part of the family doing all this hard work, uh, Cynthia, Carlito himself. This is... This is an example of people you want to remember and you want to always look at them with a smile. You know, I just love that community of Amanda. When I met her in person, it was that woman has an energy that you, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you just, I want her to be my friend. I don't care. She's great. Want I want, she's my, you know, I consider her my friend. I recently met, met also ladies in the industry that are the second generation or the third generation in Dominican. Raquel Quesada is one of them. Oh, yes. She yes. works like there's no tomorrow. She's a social figure. She, she's number one in the factory. Of course, she has her father, the biggest figure, and the guy is a big, big person, big per persona in the world of cigar. And the work she has done with, you know, she has a small family. She's everywhere. These are people I look forward to be 
tiny but mighty in there in, in that in, in my opinion i should be tiny but i can be you know existing one day i don't want people to forget that mighty presence of the tiny person i am absolutely in the words that anastasia taught me standing alongside every good man is a great woman and romy you are that great woman Thank, Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us tonight. I truly, truly appreciate it. I appreciate you being an open book and to go down yes. some of uh, some of these avenues. And I hope I gave you something different um, to kind of show who you are more uh, to the world than you have had in other interviews. And Hireman Solomon will forever be part of the Rocky Mountain Cigar Show family and will forever be uh, more than welcome to come back as often as either of you, each of you, independently or together, would like to come. So thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being a fantastic woman in the cigar world. Yes. And just thank you for being you. And thanks for so much for coming on. I really, truly appreciate Before it. Before we say goodbye, I'm, I want to say also a word about some person that I just, it just popped up, the bubble popped up. Karen Berger is a mentor. Yes. Yes. I love to, Karen. I love this lady with all the story behind her and I wish her all the success. She's someone who made it happen. Exactly. Karen, kudos. Good luck in everything she does. She's a woman I aspire to 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 even achieve one percent of what she has done. Yes, Karen was an absolute and pleasure Bruce, to have on. Yeah, her and Bruce. Her, every single person was attending this beautiful gathering tonight. Everyone, Larry, every Bill, all of them. These are family. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you to thank you absolutely thank you to Lauren for to Romy uh, for coming on and spending the night with me and as always thank you to everybody that tuned in tonight I hope you really truly enjoyed the show I learned a ton uh, and I also learned that uh, I have a kindred spirit in Romy so I truly appreciate it. And uh, Lauren, I hope you had a great time as well. Yes. I, I was just riveted, honestly. <laughs> I just love listening to you talk. You have oh, just just so profound. Absolutely. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you both too. Yes. All of them and all of us, big family. Let's keep it like that. Have a lovely night. And it was a pleasure. Ab absolutely. Thank you. And until we see you all again, smoke what you like, smoke as often as you can, and have a great rest of the night. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks a lot.